Hello, everyone, and welcome back to BFG Financial Advisors webinar series. Um, for those who have been on before, it's nice to see you again. And for those that are new, uh, my name is Cody Niedermeyer, and I'm an associate at uh, BFG and lucky enough to uh, work directly with our guest today. But before we get into that, uh, I want to remind everybody that at the end of this webinar, there will be a Q&A session for questions that you guys have throughout the presentation, because I'm sure they will arise. And we're going to do our best to address those at the end. So feel free to shoot those over. We'll call in um, our director of marketing, who uh, will make us aware of those questions. And we'll try to address uh, everything in, we can in the time period we have. But without further ado, uh, I think it's uh, time to get into things. So obviously, our topic today is paying yourself first, creative strategies to grow your savings. And we are extremely lucky because I know this man is very busy, but he made time today to join us. And that is one of the principles of BFG, uh, who I see as a huge mentor to me, who I work directly with, like I mentioned before, uh, Yanni Niebuhr. No, Cody, you're, you're too kind. Um, uh, nice words, I guess you could say, and probably the nicest ones you've ever said to me. So yeah. feeling flat here and a, a little red from that, so I appreciate it. Um, yeah. But excited to be here. Uh, it's nice to, to have someone else other than Eric and Lena taking the, the torch for a little bit and having some other voices from the firm. No, absolutely. And I'm excited to have you uh, as well. Just different perspective, you know, a different advisor. Right. Everyone's different. And I think you're going to, especially to this topic, bring a lot of uh, valuable information that I think a lot of people are going to be able to pull from. But like we said, this is your first time joining me for this webinar. And mm -hmm. it's kind of cool from my perspective because, you know, usually, usually you're running the meeting. So right now I get to put you on the spot. Uh, pick your brain as we move through the subject. So I'm, I'm super excited. But for those listeners who don't know you, maybe aren't clients of yours right now, uh, I was hoping you can give a little background information about who you are, where you come from, uh, you know, how you've gotten to the point you're at today. Right. Now, um, well, this topic um, is right in my wheelhouse because it's, you know, the, the things that are near and dear to my heart. You know, you're coming through and you're, you're growing not only yourself professionally, but you're focusing on your, your short, intermediate, and long-term plans. And mm -hmm. um, this is how you get there. So from my perspective, I came here to be from um, Towson. I was an unpaid intern with uh, BFG in the beginning. And part of the requirement to graduate from Towson was an unpaid internship. And I was working at a bank at that time when they knew Eric and you couldn't do unpaid internships at the bank. So um, the employer there said, Eric, hey, we, um, we have an opening. We need an intern here for this. Would you take him? Eric said, no. And uh, they said, well, it's free. So would you do it anyway? And he begrudgingly said yes. And from that point, I started as an intern, went through operations, to associate advisor, to a lead advisor, to now I'm one of the, the four shareholders of the firm. And so nice. I work exclusively with about a third of the clients here at the firm, going through everything from financial planning to investment management, to everything in their world, which is, again, how we became here today to talk about, you know, paying yourself first. Yeah. So you're, I mean, a man of all trades. You started... Uh what some might say the bottom and you know you worked your way up through the back office uh being an associate working directly with an advisor and just kind of just kept moving up some might say the food chain um, exactly you know, to to get to where you are and that's mm -hmm. that's awesome and i think that really is a unique perspective that a lot of people who identify as advisors don't have um right. you know creating the accounts opening the accounts and doing everything on that end so uh i know i've been able to pick your brain a lot and learn from you just from that aspect of us having similar backgrounds of, you know, I started in investment ops, as you're well aware, uh, <laughs> to where I am today. So uh, mm -hmm. like I said, you're you're a large mentor to me, but I enough of the sentimental stuff, I think. Uh, I know. Let's get into why people are here. Yep. I was about to say, let's get this thing going. And I think it's really important just to say, you know, other than the disclosure, sorry, I got a little click <laughs> no, happy there. But um, what does it mean to pay yourself first? Mm -hmm. What's kind of the emphasis of this entire presentation? Sure. Uh, well, paying yourself first is more like a mentality. So you're focusing on savings and paying down, you know, high interest rate debt before you're getting into anything else. And the idea is rather quite simple and has a lot of psychology involved in it. Because um, the example that I use for everybody is um, if you have a, a Spotify and a Netflix account, and you're paying money along and you know what bills are racking up and you're not quite going to hit your savings goal are you likely to you know cancel your spotify and netflix to make sure you hit your savings target? probably not on the other hand um bills are piling up money's getting a little tight rent is coming due are you likely to cancel spotify and netflix to make sure you can pay your rent 
Most likely, yes. So with the idea here of paying yourself first, you're saying, all right, I'm making a thousand dollars a paycheck, I'm making up a number, and mm -hmm. saying, I'm going to take two hundred of that, and I'm going to forget that I had to even exist, and I'm going to take that two hundred dollars per paycheck and put it into either some sort of savings vehicle, whether it's meant for short-term goals all the way down through long-term, saying I want to retire at X, or something in between, or saying, you know what, I'm going to save some of it, but the other part's going to go to some high-rate debt that I need to get rid of because that's part of my intermediate goals is to get rid of those pieces. And so that brings me back. I'm saying short-term, I'm saying intermediate, I'm saying long-term because Pay yourself first is all about goal-based planning and saying, let me create okay. what I want it to be over the course of the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and then even beyond that. And saying, what do I need to focus on to get me to those goals? And then reassessing every few months, saying, all right, am I getting closer to or further from? Them? Okay. And, you know, as you've just mentioned, the, the idea of having short-term, intermediate, long-term goals uh you know some people in the audience might be you know what's the difference you know um okay. could you dive That's a, fair. yeah could you dive um, in a little bit deeper on those sure i mean a short-term goal could be as simple as you know an emergency fund I mean, part of the problem that a lot of americans run into we, we read all these articles talking about the, the amount of debt that americans have yeah. in care of a lot of that's credit card debt part of the problem is that 60 percent of americans don't even have a thousand dollars saved in a bank account to deal with an emergency and you know, a refrigerator now it costs more than a thousand dollars. Your HVAC goes up. You need heat. You need air conditioning. And what you don't want to have happen is saying, okay, well, I don't have a thousand dollars in my bank account to cover that expense, so let me go put it on a credit card. Now you've got a 17% interest credit card, which you were already making minimum payments on, and now you've just compounded that problem. So making yeah. sure you have a, a goal that's targeted for those various things is important. Um, an intermediate term goal could be. Anywhere from, you know what, I want to buy a house in the next five years. Mm -hmm. Or I have student loans and I want to make sure they're paid off in the next five to ten. And how do I get to do those things? Um, talking about the housing market for a second, um, what we're seeing now is it's very simple to sell your house. Heck, I mean, you'll put your house in the market and nine times out of ten, it's sold before it even actually hits the market. For more than you were asking, which is wonderful, except for the problem that there's no house to buy on the other side of that. So if yeah. you've sold your house, now you have no place to live. But as a buyer, that is meaning that it is so competitive. But if your intermediate term goal is saying, all right, I want to save up enough to get that house. Well, now you're planning from that standpoint saying, all right, what do I need to get in order to buy that house? Because if I go and find it, what I don't want to do is give an offer to that, that seller and say, okay, well, now I got to go see if I can get financing. So by the time you talk to the bank and they approve you, yeah. oh, the seller's gotten 15 different offers and it's already gone off the table. And so that doesn't help you. But starting to plan now for those things and saying, all right. How much do I need saved? I got to make sure I have my down payment, I have my closing cost expenses, and all the different stuff, you know, the taxes and the stamps and all the things that go along with it. But then saying, all right, now I've gotten pre approved by the bank. So when I go and find the house, say, I'm pre approved. Here's my offer. Take it or leave it. Let's go. <laughs> and if you're ready to go on to the next phase and you know, or it could be student loans saying, I want to be done this over a course of period of time. I don't want to keep making those minimum payments. And I want to know when that's going to be done so I can snowball it into something else or credit cards or those types of things. And then lastly, long term, that could honestly just be retirement. You know, you're, you're in your 30s and 40s and you don't want to do that forever. You know, the, the joke I always ask clients is like, so when do you retire and don't tell me tomorrow? And then, you know, most people that are clever will say, all right, today. Uh, but figuring it out of when you want to truly retire and saying, all right, those plans and, you know, it's going to change over time. You know, life is not static. It's dynamic. You know, the goals that you had when you were 20 is going to be different than 30 and different than 40. Mm -hmm. and heck, they might be different than they are three months from now. So revisiting those periodically and saying, all right, how do I structure those differently? What is important to me? What isn't is going to be important to figuring out what your next steps are and where you should be allocating your dollars. Yeah. And I guess diving even more deep into that, uh, it sounds mm -hmm. like when you're creating the, the short term goal to backtrack a little bit and the idea of an emergency fund, would you say, I hate using the term rule of thumb, but, you know, a good starting place is, you know, usually having three to six months of income saved up where, you know, the HVAC does happen or mm -hmm. a fender bender and you need to replace a bumper or anything like that. Or mm -hmm. everyone's also different in having an idea of, you know, what do I need in that bank account for when, you know, I lay in bed and I put my head on that pillow, I'm comfortable and I go to sleep versus, you know, I'm staying right. up thinking, oh, what, what could happen next? And what am I not prepared uh, for? Not fair. Um, you know, you can read on the internet and there's a barometer typically it's between three and six months worth of expenses. Yeah. But everybody is unique in that standpoint. It depends, you know, you know, you could have a husband and wife, spouses, et cetera, and they're making two different incomes. So you might need closer to the six because they're two varying degrees in incomes. Or you might just be on your own, you only need three. And then that's the mathematical side of it. You know, here we can figure out what the mathematical approach is to saying, all right, this is what you need as an emergency fund. 
But there have been plenty of times where I've told someone, all right, mathematically, you need 15 grand in savings to cover the next mm -hmm. six months worth of expenses or three months. And they'll say, Yanni, I get you. I hear what you're saying. But psychologically, if I don't have $25,000 in that bank account, yeah. I am not able to sleep at night. Okay, perfect. There's nothing wrong with that. That extra 10 grand, right now at least, it's going to earn you a whopping 0. 0.000. I can go on for five minutes yeah. on that zero. 1%. And it is what it is for interest rates right now. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. That won't always be the case. But on the other side of that, when I say, you know, you need 15 grand, say, well, I'm comfortable with five. We have a different conversation saying, well, that's great and all, but what happens there is say an emergency happens and pretend it's March of last year. And the emergency happens, well, yeah. people stop getting paychecks for a while. And if that happens and you're used to living on five, six, seven thousand dollars a month, and now you only had five grand in the bank, well, you're good for almost a month. But then at that point, the only way to make it up is say you had an after-tax account. Now you have to sell Apple, Amazon, Google, whoever it is, low mm -hmm. and at a loss, but in a time where you really don't want to be selling low. And so mm -hmm. those things happen left and right. And that's why I'm saying you need to make sure that an emergency fund is part of your primary core um, to make sure that you have the, the right structure to get you through to retirement. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, the second thing I wanted to dive into a little bit was just the idea of that long-term goal and retirement. Mm -hmm. And I know it's it's something we throw around in our office and especially when we're working with our clients and the idea of, you know, retirement's not that finish line. It's it's actually graduation when you're making these plans. Yes, mm -hmm. I want to be at a point where I'm not financially dependent on my job uh, versus graduating like how are you sure. going to find fulfillment when you reach that point it's i think we make the reference of you know we can only watch so much days of our lives when exactly. we do retire before you're sit, sick of sitting on the couch or anything like that um and graduating and like what's the next step versus yeah, i made it it's figuring out what you want retirement to look like because everybody's going to be different you know some people they want the yacht in the mediterranean so other people it's as you mentioned days of our lives in general hospital and they're happy sitting on the couch i would lose my mind um but everybody's different. But what you want to do is figure that out because you can't go from working 40, 50, 60 hours a week to zero. You have to figure out what you're going to occupy your time with. And, you know, some people, it's, well, I'm going to work part time, make a little bit of money. Others, it's hobbies. You know, some it's philanthropic. Well, hobbies and philanthropy, you're going to spend money in one way or another. And mm -hmm. so there's actually become expensive hobbies. And so figuring out not only what you're going to do, but where you're going to allocate your dollars is super important. Because yeah. leisure and travel and vacations, they are more expensive and going up by more than the cost of inflation. So having those ideas, and that, that's impossible to figure out when you're in your 30s. You know, I have a thought of what I want retirement to look like. It's going to change 50 times between now and then. Part of that's going to be, you know, where are my kids located? You know, my plan is to eventually move someplace where there isn't snow in the winter. But if they're both in Maine, guess what? I'm probably going to be in Maine. And so that's just the reality. So it's going to change. Starting to talk about those things and, you know, Figuring out what do you want to do so you can at least get a barometer to set now, super important. And then automating some of those goals mm -hmm. as much as you can right now. The setting to forget. The reason why subscriptions work is because you set, you forget it, and you're not paying that bill every month. You know, the same, the, the old oh, yeah. archaic ones that I've got to write a paper check for, now I absolutely hate. The fact that I've got, you know, various bills that I've got to write checks for individually now, it's just like, is there any way for me to go online and automate this? The same thing can be said or your savings. And it doesn't mean you have to go from zero to 100 right away where you're taking 25, 30, 40% of your savings and then automatically tossing in there, but you can automate some of those, even if it's as simple as splitting your paycheck into a couple of different accounts. One is in and out for your checking, one is for a savings account where you're actually turning around and you know using that to build your emergency fund. And you might have a third savings account where it's specifically meant to put money in so that you're pushing money out then to prepay debt and focus on those pieces. Then the next one could be your retirement account that you're using through your employer. So you can have various avenues there and that's okay, but it becomes automated so that you forget about, you know, a percentage of your income and you're automatically paying your future. Yeah. So it sounds like this automation really is the first step that you can take in order to start achieving these goals that, you know, you've adjusted with this new mental mind or mental mindset, excuse me, but you know, mental image of how you're looking at your finances. Set it and forget it. I like it. I like it. And I think that transitions really well into growing up. My family's living on a budget. We're having PB&Js for dinner and <laughs> just that negative connotation of the word budget. And it just feels like a huge restriction. Um, so how is the pay yourself first versus mm -hmm. budgeting? How do How are those similar? How are those different? What's 
Mm -hmm. Why is pay yourself first the better method, uh, in sure. your opinion? Um, now, we are very clear with, with clients that we don't ever yeah. put them on a budget because, you know, budget has a negative connotation behind it. Yes. But what you're looking at with a budget, I liken it to being on a diet. You know, it's great in okay. theory. You put a lot of time, effort, energy into it. You, you start it. You, you have your focus and it's going well for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then life happens, just like a diet, you know, and I, I, I can use a perfect example for last night. I, you know, my goal was, you know, chicken breast and broccoli going forward. We're about to come into summer. And then the last game of the season for the Capitals on last night, and my mm -hmm. wife said, let's get some, some pizza and wings. And there wasn't a split second hesitation for me to say, absolutely. And certainly that's perfect. And so I said, like, that's what we had. And so right away, something in life happened, changed, done. The same thing happens with budgeting. What you're going back and saying, all right, well, you know, this big expense just popped up. Or, or you know, people are inviting me out and do X, Y, and Z. So mm -hmm. instead of being able to put that $400 I was expecting to away this month, it's going to be 250 and you can rationalize that, and that keeps happening. But with pay yourself first, again, going back to that same scenario, you had a thousand bucks, you're taking 200 of it, immediately putting it to your targets, mm -hmm. short, intermediate, and long term. And then other 800, that is what you're using to live on, and saying this is what I'm going to focus on. So it allows you to stay pretty broad and big picture, and without having to narrow down into the and get bogged down into those details that you're running yeah. into, where you can see problems and have to, you know, turn around and say, all right, well, now I can't save this much this month. But I'm going to get it next month, and then next month something else happens, and so those things keep happening, and that's why I think budgeting is more like dieting. It's it's good for a certain period of time, but it's not sustainable. Now, of course, there's exceptions to the rule, and some people are able to sustain and do those things, but mm -hmm. most people they can't. Yeah, no, I I think that's a very good explanation of you know how that budgeting does have that negative connotation, and the pay yourself first just it kind of takes those worries and. The mental stress, like it's mentally exhausting saying, oh, I can't do this because I can't spend this much or anything along those lines versus pay yourself first. It's like, oh, no, I have I've got this left over. I can, you know, go to the movies. Well, yeah, COVID per minute, yeah, of course. It's a real thing. You know, we've all done it. I, I made those mistakes, too, with budgeting. When we were mm -hmm. saving for a wedding, there were times where it was, you know, the, the ramen noodles and hot dogs were, were a staple of my diet. And I had a, quite a heavy sodium diet, but it was part of budgeting. It's like, all right, I'm going to make sure that. I have this money to live on and it was focused that way. But, you know, every once in a while, even at a young age, like, oh, well, perfect. People want to go out and have fun. Well, I just won't save as much this week. Yeah. It happens. But I guess that builds into kind of what we're going to go into next of, mm -hmm. you know, is there an easy way or a certain type of game plan, as some might say, of how much I should be saving of my income? Sure. Um, well, it's a broad based question, number one, because yeah. everybody is, you know, unique to their individual life. So that, that's number one. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to make sure that you're focusing specifically on you and in creating a plan that works with your specific short, intermediate, and long-term okay. goals. Um, so there's, I mean, you can go online and find 20 different ways that people say, this is how you should be doing one. And the largest one that you'll find that everyone talks about is the 50-30-20 the rule. And it's weird that, you know, as a financial advisor, I'm touting something that was made popular by Elizabeth Warren. Um, yeah. But, you know, it was something that has caught on and people look at it. And it does have merits to, to work at, from a starting point. But from mm -hmm. there, you need to figure out what works specifically for you. And there are some things about it that don't actually work. And I'm going to mention that here in a second. But you know, mm -hmm. the 50-30-20 rule is the thought process that 50% of what you make goes to your needs. So think about that as being your mortgage, your rent, utilities, um, student loans, food, those type of things. And if you have kids, daycare. 30% um, would then go into your wants. So that's going on vacations, that's Netflix, that's Hulu, that's the gym, um, going out to eat and just having fun in general. And then the last 20%, when you get there, goes into your savings or paying down debt. And so those are your retirement accounts, emergency funds, and then or paying down credit cards, those type of things. Um, I actually call it the, the, the 20, 50, 30 rule because you yeah. want to, again, focus 20 first, and then 80% actually goes to everything else. And you know, when I talk to clients, it's saying, all right, you know, your long-term goal here is to do X, to get you to the finish line. And then we'll figure out what the finish line is and what you're going to do after that. Um, but are you hitting that target? If the answer is yes, I truly don't care what you're spending the other 80% on or whatever that percentage is. Fair. I don't. You know, make sure that you're, you're paying your rent or your mortgage and those bills because the last thing you want to do is create credit card debt over here because you're hitting your 20% mm -hmm. over here. That is a recipe for disaster. But you don't need to create a budget. There's no need to worry about what you're spending on Amazon and Target and all those places because you've got your 20 here. You're not racking up bad debt. So yeah. it, it's really what you want it to be. 
And you can say, well, you know, I don't want a big house. I want a, a smaller house. So now I can actually spend more freely here to have some fun or take bigger vacations or longer vacations, whatever you want it to be. Um, and so that rule works as a broad basis. But again, everybody's yeah. different. Somebody might want to retire at 65 and then work part time because they don't know what they're going to do with themselves. Others might say, Yanni, I, I'm putting away with instant gratification. I want to retire in my 40s and 50s and I am going to save 70 cents on the dollar. Wonderful, good for you. You're going to be retired early. And you're going to be really happy, but you're probably going to be miserable in the interim. Um, yeah. But everybody's different. And so you need to make sure you know you find out what's it most important to you. Writing those down, figuring out those goals, and then getting it down and saying, all right, is 50 the right number for my needs? Is 30 the right number for my wants? And is 20 the right number for my savings and my debt free payment? Everybody's going to be different. And I'll even use myself as the example. You know, I was hitting all those goals. I was very happy. You know, we're getting there. Our, my wife and I were watching us progress towards those. And then our son was born. And I got sticker shocked real quick of understanding of how expensive daycare is and i went holy cow it is more than my mortgage and that 20 50 30 rule went out the window real quick and so we had to have a conversation with our advisor who's lena neville here in the office and saying look mm -hmm. my priorities have shifted a little bit you know shocker parents want the best for their kids who knew and so mm -hmm. with that i said all right well i had planned to retire at x number of years Yes, I'm in my 30s now and I'm looking 40 years out, but that's just how my mind works. And I have a spreadsheet for every month until I'm 65. My wife loves that. Um, that was oh, a joke. I'm sure she um, does. But there, it adjusted that and saying, all right, you know what? I'm okay working a couple extra years yeah. because it's far more important to both of us to focus on the short and intermediate term to get my son the best education possible, to take care of those things and get him to the next step. And if mm -hmm. we have more kids doing the exact same thing which means that I'm always adjusting my goals. What I thought was important to me three years ago, not as important now. It's still important, but in terms of a tier system, it's changed. So knowing what's important to you, at least right now, and being able to get a basis for it is important. Now, of course, you know, over time, we were able to understand how our finances were, and we've been able to ramp back up on certain pieces. But our goals change, and our priorities have to shift, and so does your, your plan with it. Um, and then once you get to those long-term pieces there, we've alluded to a few times, figuring out what you want to do in retirement, you know, yeah. what your next iteration of yourself needs to be to say, all right, well, you had this money, you were living like this, but now you're going to make a dramatic shift. You've been working the last 40 years of your life, getting a paycheck on the, the 7th and 21st of every month. Mm -hmm. That's all gone. What is it going to be to you now? Yeah. So continually reviewing these goals is extremely important to, you know, goals change and we have to adjust here and being able to pivot, which I know in our industry, it's avoiding the blanket statements is the term we like to use of, you right. know, this it, is good for everybody, but mm -hmm. that's not it, the case. When everybody's doing. unique. And, you know, yes. we, we probably, you know, everybody comes to the table with stuff we most likely have seen before in some way, shape or yeah. form. But when you put it all together, that recipe is unique to you. And so that, that's one of the things where I always say, you know, don't pay attention to your neighbor next door mm -hmm. or the person in the office next to you. You know, their allocations, their retirement plans, everything that they're doing mm -hmm. is unique to them. And so you need to make sure what you're doing is specific to what your family wants to get out of life and when you want to retire and do those various things. You know, yeah. um, Eric always jokes about, you know, what the, the next stage of it is. Or actually, we actually joke about Eric on those pieces. Yeah. And saying that, you know, wow. it's not that you're retiring, you're graduating. Look at that shameless mm -hmm. plug for behind you um, <laughs> there. But you're graduating to the next phase of your life. And so it's the same thing here, what you want that to be. And so everybody's number is going to be different. You, you go online and you see, well, the, the barometer for that is typically you need 25 times your income to retire, which, okay. you know, mathematically, if you average 5% over that course of time, means that if you save 20%, it's going to take you over 40 years to get there. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be super important to get it started uh, as soon as you can to those places so that you can get to that finish line, so you can get to graduation, but at the same time, being smart with your money. You know, we've seen a lot of wild things happen this year that, yeah. you know, that people weren't thinking of. And, you know, we saw that GameStop all of a sudden was one of the best performing mm -hmm. stocks in the first couple of months. And that surprised a lot of people. And I was getting phone calls, you know, GameStop's up, you know, two, 300 percent. Should I buy it? I said, you know. Where are you at with other things? And is this your fun money or is this your true money? And having those conversations. And then, you know, people asking about Dogecoin, which is a cryptocurrency that was made as a joke. Yeah. And saying, well, wow, but people are seeing in the news and saying, well, GameStop's up 300%. You know, Dogecoin's mm -hmm. up 10,000. Should I buy into it? 
typically when it's in the news, everybody already knows about it. And the boat is already like sailed, the ship is gone. And so you're usually buying it at the high point. Now money that you had planned for your retirement just got cut in half. And so I'm making sure you have those different buckets to know exactly how you want to structure things. Missing the icebergs while also getting some mm -hmm. of the upside is wildly important. And, you know, I think it's safe to assume that the people watching this webinar are probably in the same boat that I am, you know, the section of their life. You know, yeah. they have parents getting older, they're progressing through their careers, and they may have kids they're taking care of and trying to educate. And, and so with that, you know, you, you came out of school, you were dealing with the throes of the, the financial crisis. So you've been through two big events in our life. You dealt with the financial mm -hmm. crisis. All right, you, you went to school. They, they told you you had to go to college, take out student loans. They didn't teach you about you know, compounding math and all the various things that went along with it, but you came out expecting a high salary. It was right after the financial crisis. If you were lucky enough to get a job, it wasn't as high paying as you were promised, but you've started to then progress through your career. We're doing well in 2019. Yeah. Everybody's growing. You know, we're getting promotions. We're starting families. We're buying houses. And then just kidding, we have the pandemic. And so if you didn't start to have those, you know, the blocking and tackling done, you had the emergency fund, you didn't have those focuses there. Well, the 50, 30, 20 rule, or the 20, 50, 30 rule, um, went out the window real quickly. And so, you know, a couple generations now have just had it in from on a cycle basis. And so making sure that you don't have to sell the apples and Amazons and, and, you know, all those of your portfolio low to make sure that you can recover and make ends meet and put food on the table is important. And so, yeah. you know, that's why I come back to saying, you know, how much of your income should I be saving? It all comes down to what those three segments of goals are. And saying, well, this is what you want to get out of retirement. This is when you want to do it. So here's the mathematical number, but that may be more of a, there's doing nothing and everything down to perfect and everything in between. Let, let's figure that out together. But a baseline there, again, if you go online, that that's the structure there is try to shoot for at least 20%. And the good news is there's ways to get there without dramatically impacting. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you bring a lot, a lot of good points and I, definitely think there's some people listening to this that as you've kind of already touched on a little bit it's oh 20 percent. but what if my salary is not large enough where i feel like that's really making a difference sure. is it even worth my time um right. getting that 20 percent in there and your example was perfect of save the 200 out of a thousand the 20 percent just happened to work out that way but um what would you say to those people that are worried that you know they don't think that 20 percent mm -hmm. is significant enough to, for them to sure. reach those goals Sure. Um, well, it used to be that, that you know, I, I likened uh, retirement to sort of a, a stool. You had three different pillars. You okay. had pensions um, that have all but gone away outside of being, you know, on the state level or the public level or the federal level. You have Social Security, which if they don't make drastic changes, is supposed to be broke here in the next couple of years, which is really scary. And then you yeah. have your own savings. And so focusing on your own savings is all the more important now. And so knowing that you can have enough assets there to cover your expenses in retirement has mm -hmm. gotten to the forefront now more than ever before. It's under the microscope. Um, right now, the, the average salary in the United States for someone in the throes of their career is right around 50 grand. So let's use that as our number. Okay. Um, from that standpoint, let's say, you know, the, the average person in their 30s has right around $42,000 in their retirement accounts. The mm -hmm. average person in their 40 has right around 100 grand. And some people on this might be going, holy cow, that's a lot more than I have. Those are the averages. That's not the median. The average includes someone with zero in it and someone with $500,000 in their 401k and everything in between. Yeah. Not a great barometer. Now the median for someone in their 40s is 36 grand. So that's split down the middle right there. So $36,000 is what the median person in the United States has in their 401k. That's not going to cover it in you know, 20 and 30 and 40 years from now. And you're going, oh, gosh, well, that, that sounds like a bad thing. But let, let's use the same scenario that we were sticking with here, where you said you have a salary of $50,000, the average. Mm -hmm. Well, most employers in the United States offer some sort of retirement account. Let's use a 401k. Okay. The same can be said with a 403b. They're pretty much the same, just some, some different operational pieces. to mm -hmm. it. But most of them have that retirement account plus a company match. The average in the United States for that is 3.5%. So okay. in that scenario, you're making $50,000. Let's pretend you just contribute the match of three and a half percent of your salary. So you're putting in seventeen fifty a year into your four hundred one k. Your company okay. is now putting another three and a half percent, so they're seventeen fifty. So you're putting in thirty five hundred dollars a year combined between the two of you. you now, now instead of doing three and a half, you're actually doing seven. 
you've now just doubled what you're doing right there and then. And you're saying, well, $3,500 a year doesn't sound like a whole lot of money. That's really not going to change the needle for me or, or move it one way or the other to retirement. But over time, it will. Say you start doing that at 30. You know, you're in the throes of your career and you start really ramping up savings. And when I'm saying ramping up, I'm saying three and a half percent here. Well, you put yeah. that $3,500 away every year from that time before retirement age of Social Security. You get an average of 8%, which is not, you know, some dramatic number. You know, some mm -hmm. years it's going to be, you know, 15. Some years it's going to be negative seven, but you're averaging eight. That $3,500 a year is actually 700, over $700,000 in retirement. And to give you a wow. sense right now, someone in their 60s, the median right now is 62 grand. So just getting the, doing the average, the company match, gets you to 10 times what the typical American has in their 60s in their retirement account. Wow, and that's just doing three and a half percent. We're talking about you know the barometer should be twenty, and so but the good news is you don't have to start at twenty. You know even if you're saying you know what let's do three and a half percent, let's get our company match. It's mm -hmm. free money, and saying all right, well right now we got to focus on our emergency fund. Let's get that there so in case any big expenses happen, we've got our emergency fund. Yes, it's earning a whopping nothing. It's okay. Next, we're saying you know our intermediate term is we have credit card debt, and we're looking at those pieces. How do we pay that off? Well, we stop paying our emergency fund. Now we've moved over to credit card debt with snowballed into those pieces there. Credit yeah. cards pay off. Well, that's all part of that 20 piece now. Now you're ramping up your savings. You're not, you're not adding that money that you're putting towards your emergency fund or your credit cards to your lifestyle. You're still pretending it doesn't exist. So instead of three and a half, yeah. you're doing five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And some of that can be automated. A lot of 401ks now oh. have the ability to turn around and make auto increases every year. So you can add one or 2% to set and forget, just like everything else, that on January 1st, I'm gonna go from three and a half to four and a half, to five and a half, to six and a half. Because every year you're gonna get raises, even if mm -hmm. it's a cost of living adjustment. And ideally you're getting promotions as you go through your career as well. So at that point, well, you've got a promotion. Have a conversation with your advisor. Well, I just got a raise of 10%. Let's figure out some of that's gonna to have to go to lifestyle and paying off stuff, but some of that's going to turn around and you found money for your retirement accounts. And specifically here, the 401k or the 43p or whatever your employer sponsor plan is. You're taking advantage of that match and at least starting there. Yeah, I think the 401k, 403b example is awesome because I feel like that's found definitely in most businesses, companies and different things. But I guess to build on top of that, what are some other you know savings vehicles that maybe some of the mm -hmm. listeners or somebody who listened to the recording you know, should keep an eye out for or try to take advantage of that sure. could really help them reach those mm -hmm. goals? Um, a couple other ones that you have are Health savings accounts, for instance. Uh, okay. A health savings account is an incredibly powerful tool because you put in money pre-tax, it grows tax deferred, and oh, by the way, typically over one to $2,000 that's in it, depends on the plan, you can actually invest that money and grow it for the long term, just like you do a 401k or another retirement account. And then when you take it out in retirement, you don't pay any taxes on it if you use it for healthcare, which unfortunately, as we get older, we get less healthy. So it's one of the only types of accounts out there. You put in money pre-tax, it never touches with taxes, you can invest it and grow it. And if you take it out and use it the right way, you never pay taxes on it. You know, the, the caveat there on the downside is you have to have a high deductible plan to be able to get access to one. Okay. But if you have the ability to turn around and say, you know what, uh, you're at the drugstore, you, you have a prescription and it's a $50 copay, pretend the health savings account doesn't exist. Don't use it for the small. Yeah. Now, if life happens and you have a, you know, a surgery that comes up that's, that's a couple grand, and you don't have the cash sitting in your emergency fund for it, or it's going to deplete the emergency fund too much. Life happens, and you've got to do what you got to do. That's what the account is intended for. But if you're able to forget it exists, grow it because again, it's one of the only spots where you will not pay taxes on it if you use it properly. Now, the other downside is that you only have a certain contribution limit. I'm actually going to test you here, Cody. Um, you know, as a CFP candidate, let's see if you've been paying attention to your books. So, what can you contribute an HSA? So, the fun answer that everyone loves is it depends. Uh, so, it depends on your plan. Um, if you are an individual, there's a maximum of $3,600 that can go between employee and employer contributions into the account. But if you're on a family plan, that actually increases to $7,200 per year. Uh, so it's really important also to keep track of that as you're making those contributions and your employer's making contributions because there are penalties for you know, overfunding the account and different things along those lines as well. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that was correct. <laughs> it was, good job. Um, so I'm proud of you and see you're paying attention to me when I talk in my meeting. So I appreciate that. 
every now um, and then. But yeah, it, well, you also mentioned something that I didn't is that some employers also contribute to those plans. Yep. And so that's another way to, to get a company contribution and get you closer to your retirement goals. Um, the other one that I, I like to talk about a lot mm -hmm. is uh, Roth IRAs. So yeah. with a Roth IRA, instead of getting a pre-tax deduction, like you just were talking about there with the HSA or a pre-tax mm -hmm. 401k or 403b, a Roth IRA, you're putting money in after tax. It's growing tax deferred. Mm -hmm. And then in retirement after 59 and a half, you can actually take that money out and don't pay taxes on it, which is incredible. In a time yeah. frame, you know, the old ads used to be where you're making a bunch of money, you're in the highest income bracket you're ever going to be in, do uh, pre-tax everything, you know, get as many tax deductions as you possibly yeah. can. That might not be the case anymore. You know, tax policies are changing dramatically. We're going to see a lot yeah. of them change this year. And we put through a lot of bills, spent a lot of money this year, and eventually they're going to have to raise taxes to continue paying for all that spending. The spending hasn't been a bad thing per se, mm -hmm. but there's going to be, have to be taxes to pay for it all. And so the adage of saying you want to take every pre-tax deduction you can now might not be the case anymore because you might be in a higher tax bracket in retirement, which is a weird phenomenon. Yeah. And so with the Roth IRA, you know, just like the HSA and just like the 401k, and the 401k you can put up to a max of 19.5, depending on your age, where you can add another $6,000 contribution if you're over the age of 50. Mm -hmm. uh, the HSA, um, after 55, you can add in another $1,000. You can actually bump up those yeah. two as well. But with the, the Roth, you can either do 6,000 or 7,000, depending on your age. If you're over 50, you can do up to seven. But it's another way to get money set aside that in this case and scenario, you never pay taxes, which is a, a wildly important thing. And the difference between that and the 401k particularly is within a 401k or retirement account, you've got 10, 15, 20 different investment options. In your Roth IRA, you've got 20 to 30,000 investment options. You have everything under the sun. So you're able to be more diverse and broadly defined. And at the same time there, with the Roth IRA, um, and so this would be down the line with it, but pretend you put in $10,000 and it's grown to 20. If the bad thing happens and you've depleted your emergency fund, you depleted your HSA, yeah. the things that you have there for emergencies, and you had to get access to money, that $10,000 can be accessed you know, as part of your contributions and you won't pay penalties or taxes on taking that 10 grand out. The yeah. money that's grown, if you take that out before 59 and a half, you're gonna pay penalties and taxes but it creates another savings vehicle for you. And of course, you know, as financial advisor, I beg and plead for you not to take money out of that account because again, it's one of the only that grows tax deferred and down the line doesn't pay taxes. So it'd be, yeah. you know, fourth or fifth down that line, which goes back to talking about emergency funds and why yeah. you want to make sure you have that there because I, you just don't want to sell low if you're forced to. And you know, no one saw the pandemic coming, mm -hmm. but a lot of people stopped getting incomes. And for certain people, that meant selling their apples and Amazons low because they had to. Yeah. And those are the type of things you want to make sure you avoid. And, you know, I mentioned Roth IRAs. They also have the option of most companies to do Roth 401k. So depending on, you know, where you are, what your goals are, or your, your income and those different factors, it might make more sense to be in the Roth 401k or Roth 403b yeah. compared to the pre-tax version. But everybody's different. Everybody's unique. And there's the shameless plug where I'm saying talk with your financial advisor. Yeah. Because again, what's going to be good for you is going to be different than the person next door to you. Yeah. And I think it's extremely important for, you know, individuals that aren't sure what they have offered through their employers. Mm -hmm. Talk to your, talk to your uh, employment, you know, get that information, get that information, the summary plan uh, description of what you have and, you know, really try to gain that knowledge of everything you have access to, because once you have that, you can start making the game plan of how do I take advantage of it to help me get to where I want to be? Yeah, it's it, you go to your HR, talk to your benefits coordinator. You can usually yep. get a snapshot of everything that's available to you. Some of mm -hmm. it's going to be, you know, a simple one page and then others are say, okay, here's a packet of, you know, 700 yeah. pages. Good luck. Everybody's different. Fingers crossed you have a good HR benefit. <laughs> yeah. And I guess this is one of my least favoritely worded title slides, which I apologize for. Uh, and it's kind of a summary of everything we've discussed so far today. Mm -hmm. uh, so which aspects of a financial plan are necessary? And then it's the while I'm young part, but I think it should also include the people who are just getting started because I mean, everyone's in different stages of their lives. And sure. if somebody's listening today and they're just getting started, you know, they're in the same shoes as, as if they just came out of school. Their time yeah. frame might be a little bit shorter, but they needed to take the same steps in order to get to the point they want to be. Yeah. It's, you know, I like to think I'm still young, but then I look around our office sometimes and realize that I'm one of the old guys now. You know, in fact, I didn't, you know, I didn't say anything. With, 
both you and our, our marketing director, Sarah, are realizing that I'm the, the old one of the three on, us, on the call. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, part of the problem, and I alluded to it before, is, you know, financial planning in its essence wasn't taught in, in school. You know, yeah. I can still remember, you know, being taught about Pythagorean theorem, hypotenuse, triangles, and all those things, uh, isosceles triangles, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem there is that, you know, when was the last time I used those? When was the last time you used the, the Pythagorean theorem? Um, exactly. Uh, I got a quiz in fifth grade. Uh, but, you know, when was the last time you looked at, you know, your credit card, balanced a checkbook, balanced your bank statement, your bills, you know, talked about compounding interest. All that stuff is relevant to today, and it's yeah. not being taught for the most part. That's and really so all this stuff has to be discovered on your own. And the earlier you go and figure it out what is essential to you, the more mm -hmm. important. So the first thing I always tell everybody is understand your credit score. You know, there are a ton okay. of online services there that are free that you can use that to sign up for, that you can find out how much debt you know, what your credit score is, and get a basic barometer for what your world looks like in terms of a debt service and your total payments. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can then use that to create your short, intermediate, and long-term goals. Say, all right, well, short term here, we're building that emergency fund. I want to make sure that is taken care of. Long term or intermediate term, I want to buy a house. I don't want to be living in my apartment and paying rent for a long period of time. Or you know what? I went to school, I have a bunch of debt, and now it's got to be paid off. Mm -hmm. How do I get to that point? Or credit cards, those type of things. And then long term, here's what we're going to next. And so you're figuring out based on here's where I'm at, here's where I want to go. And those are the first two steps there. And then from there, it's beginning to build the moat around your castle. So you know what? You're erecting your castle, you're building it up, but you also need to make sure it's protected. And so okay. saying that uh, from that standpoint, we live in a society now where everybody likes to get sued for everything. You don't like to get sued, but you like to sue everybody for everything. It's a new hobby. And so most people have, you know, they're overinsured typically on their house or, or their renter's policy, but they're underinsured in their cars. But where are you more likely to get sued? Someone falling down your stairs or when you rear end somebody while you're driving? And so, you know, people don't realize that, but it happens all the time. And so making sure that you're properly covered from a property and casualty standpoint, super important. Making sure from an employee benefit side and from a, uh, a broad based range from an insurance side that you're covered. Um, you know, you have employee benefits, we'll have group coverage in terms of life, you'll have group disability insurance, so that if something happens and you get injured, you can't work, you still got income coming in, but you need to understand how that policy works. Because yeah. typically it's either 40 or 60% of your income, but that's taxable to you. Mm -hmm. So can you live on 60% of your income that's taxed now? Most people, the answer is no. It's tough. And that's a problem. And so, and then on top of that, it might be capped at a certain number. And so making sure you're covered from that standpoint, because the problem there is that you're still alive and watching everybody else struggle while you're hung up on the couch and injured. That's a problem. Yeah. The other side of that is life insurance. You know, if, you know, family planning and those pieces are important aspects, you know, it's not fun to talk about life insurance because the bad thing has to happen for you to win. Um, but it's important to have because the last, you know, conversation you want someone to have is, okay, mom and dad are gone. You know, now we have to turn around. We have to sell our house. You've got to change schools. You have to make new mm -hmm. friends. And oh, by the way, I have to work three jobs to make ends meet. Yeah. No one wants that conversation. You know, unfortunately, the conversation should be financially we're okay, emotionally we're a wreck, and we're going to figure that out. But now I can work less because I want to be home with my kids or various people to make sure they're okay. So making sure you have those boxes checked are super important because once your moat is taken care of and you know you have the emergency fund, you know you have the right liability, the right property and casualty, the right insurance pieces there. Well, now you're protected, you're insulated. Now let's also make sure you're ramping up savings or you're paying down debt. And it could be as simple as starting with three and a half, getting your company match while you're doing some of those other short-term, long-term, intermediate-term goals, because those are going to ever change. You know, it might be that for a while there, you're doing 15, 20% to your 401k. Then, oh, by the way, we just had kids. Well, now an intermediate-term goal is how do you fund college? How do you pay for that? And so instead of doing 20%, now you're doing 15 because five has to go there. And those dollars are going to change, which is why, you know, you're starting to build a broad base of it, but you're doing it as soon as possible because the difference between starting in your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s is hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's the problem. So the sooner you get on this and focusing on what you need to do and understanding what your goals are, the better. Yeah. So really no better time to start than now. And right now, you know, ho hopefully we at least reach one person with this webinar that, you know, they're able to take something from this, but 
something tells me that uh, you know there's definitely been some questions along the way. So I think uh, I think we should dive into those. Um, okay. And I'm going to open up the floor and let uh, Sarah, our marketing director, uh, pop on in and uh, read off maybe one, two, or three of those that we have time for. Uh, Sarah, are you there? Hey guys. Welcome. Hey, uh, somebody asked, I'm in debt right now. Should I focus on paying that debt down or focus on growing my savings? Hmm. That's a good one. Okay. Um, I'm going to say the answer is yes. <laughs> that one. Everyone's um, favorite answer. Everyone's favorite answer to that. So um, what I mean by that is that it's a combination. So with that, you know, you want to start with an emergency fund. I, I, I've parked yeah. here probably six, seven, eight times, and it's nothing mm -hmm. fun and exciting. It, it really, truly isn't. You're earning nothing on your money right now. That will change as interest rates go up and you'll feel better about your money. But at the same time, if in that scenario, you know, you have high interest rate debt and you want to pay it down and do those things that will come. But if you don't have that emergency fund, well, there might come an emergency. Well, now you're using the credit card that you're trying to pay off. To take care of the emergency. Now you just compound the problem and now you're putting more money on it and you're still making the minimum payments. That's its own issue. Once you've gotten your emergency fund, you figure out what that number needs to be. Uh, from there, then you're turning around and snowballing into your credit card debt and you're focusing on that. At the same time, you might say, all right, well, now that that's taken care of and I'm, I'm going there, um, then you can look at little things like, you know, making sure you have the company match. But typically you can do the company match times stay small. So at least you're putting something and you're getting the free money on the other side. Because again, back to the $50,000 scenario, that's $1,750 a year of free money. That's not nothing. And so trying to get that while also focusing on the debt and the emergency fund is going to be the biggest key. But, you know, it, it's everybody's unique and you have to figure it out together. And that's, again, why I say talk to your financial advisor, have that question saying what makes the most sense for our scenario. And Yanni, I like the idea of, you know, redirecting those debt payoffs because, you know, a lot of times it isn't just one debt that I have. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's two and identifying, you know, which one should I attack first? But then, you know, once that's paid off, I've already been living how I've been living. Why don't we redirect that payment to the other one? And then, right. like you said, it kind of has that snowball effect of, wow, I'm really taking my toll and knocking these this debt out faster than I ever thought I could. And just right. have that as a debt reduction plan is a, a yep. term we like to use. Yeah, it's a, you create a debt reduction plan. And as you've paid off one, you've snowballed it to the next. And then the joke I make with everybody that we go through those and once we bleed, mm -hmm. I say, and once that's done, I have plans for that money. And so... You're yeah. not going to all of a sudden turn around and say, all right, well, now I've got an extra $500 a month and I'm going to adjust my lifestyle accordingly. Nope. You're going to pretend that money is still not yours and we're going to direct it here X, Y, and Z to get to those intermediate and long-term goals. Definition of pay yourself first. Exactly. But uh, Sari, you got another one for us? I do. Ooh. If I don't need the money until 20 years from now, is a whole life insurance cash value policy the best place to put extra money versus 401k Roth IRA? And can I use the money later in life for whatever I want? And is it taxed as income? So three part question. Okay, so um, 20 years from now, whole life policy, and then what makes the most sense? Um, I love whole life policies in general. In fact, I have them yeah. on my son, which is, you know, people always say that's a weird not thing, but it's number one, to build cash value, and number two, to protect his insurability against God forbid something happens to him later in life, he can get more insurance. Um, okay. I look at whole life from that standpoint as a value add once everything else is done. You've checked off all the other boxes. In other words, you, you're maxing out savings. Um, you're, you're hitting all of your targets from those standpoints because, in my opinion, um, insurance on its baseline should be insurance. And the, what I see, mean by that is that, you know what, if something happens to you and turn around and say, okay, you know what, you've now passed away, but you were the sole income provider. And your whole life policy, you know, they're more expensive because you have both your death benefit and your cash value. From that standpoint, you know, if something happens to you, well, the person's going to go, well, you have a $250,000 death benefit. So this is what your, you know, your spouse is going to get when you passed away. Here you go. Or for those same amount of dollars, you could have had $3 million in coverage, which would have replaced right. your income. Yes, if you're not investing that money, but at the end of the day, what is more important? And on the life insurance side, it's more important to make sure that the person that you're taking care of insuring, that's the purpose of it. Now, say you've done all those things and you're fine from that standpoint. Um, from that standpoint, then I'm saying you're most likely maxing out retirement plans, whether it is the, the, the Roth IRA, the Roth 401k, the pre-tax one. 
Um, some of those have their benefits. One is pre-tax, you're getting a deduction now. One of those is post-tax, so you're getting the deduction later on in life. And so those are typically my next stepping points. And then from there, we're looking at tax diversification. Life insurance, particularly on the whole life side, is probably going to see a dramatic increase in its issuance now because of the way it works. Most of the time, you don't take a withdrawal from the policy. You do a policy loan. And you say, well, that sounds like a terrible idea. I'm taking a loan on my own cash. And the way it works is you're still getting your dividends along the way. So it's growing. We're paying off some of those interest pieces, but you have an interest rate that's established to it. So they're offsetting one another. So you're essentially taking a private loan at a very low rate that comes out completely tax-free to you, yeah. which is a wonderful thing. Now, then you could pay the interest every year if you wanted to and offset it, or the fixed interest rate. Eventually, interest rates go up in general. The fixed interest rate on the loan is here, but now your dividends are here, and you're earning money on your own loan, which is a great thing, and it's tax-free to you, which is going to be super important probably in the next 20, 30 years as tax rates go up. So it'll have a good advantage there, but in the short term, you know, it has a, a dividend scale, um, but you're going to probably want to make sure you're maximizing other liquid investments first and then charging that as a value add. And so in addition to satellite, if you will, to your core of what you're doing. And then, Sarah, I think there was a third part to that that I'm forgetting. <laughs> Maybe. I'm trying to keep up with what you've already said. Um, <laughs> is, is putting that life insurance policy, um, putting money there better than a 401k or or Roth IRA and okay. use that money later for whatever reason I want. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so, yeah, so the way that works is again, in retirement. So to say you, you and a spouse both do whole life policies. And the idea being that, you know what, you don't want to make it so that, you know, you're just paying rent forms insurance. So one of you passes away, you now have a death benefit. Room. The other person, well, now you have cash value in your policy. It'll eventually go to your heirs or whoever you want it to be down the line. But in the immediate term, you had the death benefit from one, and then you get to use the cash that you've built up in yours in retirement as part of your withdrawal strategy to help fund some of your piece there yeah. for retirement. And oh, by the way, it's tax free to you, which means that part of your planning, you might have a 401k that's pre tax your whole life, which is not going to be taxed. And then maybe an after tax account, which is taxed at long term capital gains rates. You get to figure out with all three of those the best tax strategy based on what's happening that year with tax laws and then saying all right well now we're over the age of 65 we want to keep our medicare premiums down so we don't want to bump into another tax bracket so you might pull more from the whole life or from the uh the after tax account and less from your 401k so it creates a lot of different avenues there but again i think they're great to have as long as you've checked off all the other boxes awesome well yanni i can't describe how appreciative I am that you were able to join us today. And I'm sure everybody in the webinar is extremely thankful as well. But um, no, I mean, just being able to pick your brain on this subject, I, I know I've gained from it and I'm sure everybody else has a, a, or has as well. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, you're appreciated. And I can't wait to joke with you after this about, you know, some of the stuff I said, some of the stuff you said. Uh, I right. know we'll have a good time, but thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, Cody. Yeah, of course. Um, other than that, uh, I just wanted to make everyone aware, either you're listening live or you're going to be listening to this uh, rewatching after the fact, that a lot of the stuff we talked about today is it's in resources that we have available for you. Um, Eric Brotman, who has been on before, has his book, Don't Retire, Graduate, which is a available on Amazon, um, which I would recommend and have recommend to my mother, my father, my sister, uh, anybody that I talk to, basically. Um, it dives deeper into the pay yourself first strategy, as well as so many other uh, subjects. Uh, and Yanni did mention the, you know, free financial or not free financial, but uh, schools don't offer financial literacy courses. And we were actually able to create our own that's free. Um, whether you have a kid growing up or, you know, you want to dust off and kind of learn yourself. We have that available as well at bfguniversity.com. And we have numerous other podcasts, these webinars, and other resources that are available at BrotmanMedia.com. So please take advantage of those. And today, or to end today's session, we have this barcode on the screen inside of that little piggy bank where if you actually take your camera and you hold it up to it, you can schedule a free consultation with one of our lead advisors, possibly Yanni, um, that you know, if we didn't get to your question today, you can ask questions. Uh, we can help you kind of decipher where you're at, you know, what your goals are and, you know, where you want to go and completely free consultation. 
uh, if we get to a point where we actually think we can add value to your life or you think that we could add value to yours and we see eye to eye on that uh, and we move forward with a financial planning relationship, there's actually 10% discount by you know becoming aware through these webinars. So take that into account as well. But once again, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, I really appreciate it. I love doing these things and, you know, just putting out knowledge into the world that, you know, people have questions about. So thank you. And uh, we'll have another webinar next month. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks, Cody. Yep.